You noble diggers all, stand up now, stand up now. You noble diggers all, stand up now. Okay, well, uh, welcome everybody. This is a, a joint um, workshop, really, um, between the Land is Ours and BAM, which is the local Bristol Housing Action, which is the local um, squatting support group. Um, and I'm Tony Gosling. I do a local politics programme on the radio here. My interest in this is really to do with a very simple fact, and that is that the land is a free gift to mankind. And, and what's happened is we've managed to find ourselves in the situation where, for most of us, we've got nowhere where we're actually able to go without finding money to pay rent or mortgages. Now, to me, it seems like a simple thing to do, to find every family in every country enough land for them to live on for free without having them to pay anyone anything to be there since the earth is a free gift to mankind whichever way you look at it um, and I was really inspired by the diggers and by the land is ours as a group which was started by George Monbiot in 1975 what we organized was several land occupations uh, in and around London including the diggers original site in 1999, we squatted with 350 people uh, a, a site which was 350 years before that squatted by the diggers. Now, the diggers in the English Civil War, what they did was simply do what I've just said, saying, well, look, the earth's a free gift to mankind. He called it, Gerard Winstanley, a common treasury for all. And they said, well, if we're going to have a commonwealth, which is what the Cromwell was saying they wanted in the English Civil War, we're going to just take it the land is ours and that's where we got our name from so the diggers were a big part of certainly introducing me to this whole idea of really freeing the land um, the settlement of land uh, originally was <coughs> done in a way which suited the people who were settling it slowly but surely that land that they settled on has been privatized and that's a big part of what uh, Kevin's going to be talking about people say oh enclosure happened a long time ago privatization happened a long time ago We've still got exactly the same thing going on today where roads which had been public roads are suddenly taken over, privatised. Land which was public land is taken into private ownership and we're seeing this in all sorts of other ways. Genetic material being privatised. Um, and that's the way I see this, is, is that land and enclosure as privatisation <coughs> of, of land was one of the first and most important roads to where the, the crazy situation where we are today where we have nowhere to live. The government might provide us with somewhere if we're lucky but of course even that is being rolled back with the, all the cuts. Because Kevin was uh, at the Sunday Times between 1988 and 1990 uh, working on the Sunday Times rich list. Now fascinating idea to expose and it's what all good journalists do, expose the people that like to hide under a stone. People like the Duke of Westminster who we hardly ever see anything of is one of the richest most powerful people in the country. Uh, massive landowner in as well. Uh, Kevin's now working with a magazine called Computer Weekly uh, and he's been in the army, he's been in the Irish army, the British army and the Yemeni army. The author of Who Owns Britain and Who Owns the World, Kevin Carhill. Thank you. Thanks very much. 65% of us in the United Kingdom live in private domestic dwellings. So just to give you the, the figure the next 35% is very roughly 10 to 12% council, 10 to 12% uh, private rented, and 10 to 12% housing associations. That's the rough breakup of how we get a roof over our heads. And one of the oddest things is the drive and the, 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 the very large part of, of roofs over your head that's private was actually a complete accident. It wasn't kind of, um, there's no evidence anywhere that anybody ever sat down and said, you know, we're going to have people in Britain own their own homes. It was completely incremental and most of it started in London. People started to be given this very strange form of ownership called freehold. Who are the freeholders here? Okay, most people think freehold is ownership, it's not. 
uh, and this and the legal definition oddly is simple there's only one landowner in the United Kingdom and that's the crown that's what the government says in the website actually they're wrong there are two <laughs> down in the West there's another little landowner all on his own Prince Charles is actually the feudal superior of Cornwall and uh, the government statement is wrong it's wrong about a few other things but anyway but basically we uh, those of us who are freeholders have a lease from the crown that's what our the words used to describe how the leasehold gives us access and a freehold gives us access are out of medieval metaphysics we hold an interest in an estate in land What's an estate? What does all that mean? And there's no clear definition in uh, the United Kingdom law books. It's a fuzzy concept to give the Crown ultimate ownership and to limit whatever anybody else has. It's so ownership is then. But starting in London, probably in the 1880s, with a kind of smaller effect in the urban villages and towns <coughs> people started to get this freehold an indefinite leasehold which did uh, nearly amount to freehold uh, to ownership <coughs> but that's the land registry by the way just to show you how it works doesn't record ownership well if you think about it how could it there's only one and there's no point in putting her name on every parcel of land she owns it all uh, that's the first thing now the the creation of this 65% wedge was first of all an anomaly secondly it was unplanned and the economists don't cope with or even think about the 30% of the 65% who have no mortgage you know they paid it off People, you know, of my age, uh, tend to pay, have paid our mortgages off, and it's a big lump, economically and everything else. But have you ever seen a book that explains the relative economics of home ownership and economics itself? Because there I don't believe there is one. But here we are. We've wound up with 65% of us living in freeholds. But most of us haven't a clue what that is. And most people I ever meet have no idea the Crown owns everything. And the standard answers, answer is, well, that doesn't matter. Well, actually, it does. During World War II, the Crown r took over 11 million acres, one-sixth of the United Kingdom land. The, this, the country is 60 million acres. The Crown took... 11 million acres, a sixth, and they paid no rent. Well, how can you pay rent to yourself? Most of the land taken by the armed forces in World War II, there were other fixes. You were given money because the fences got knocked down by the lads running around, and etc., etc. But rent wasn't paid because the Crown cannot pay itself rent. So anyway, but there's the first. There's the basics. There are the basics. No, Charles. Yeah. But he's the crown as well, though, isn't he? Yeah. No, he isn't. There's only one crown, and that's Elizabeth. There aren't two. He's the heir to the crown. We ain't the crown. And the funniest thing, in the 1850s, the duchy, which is how this has happened, uh, won a high court case saying they were a feudal state. You know, they were this... <coughs> they owned... Charles and the Duchy own Cornwall the way the Queen owns everything else and they won the case. Unfortunately, there's been a lot of legislation since <coughs> and if you're the feudal superior, you have duties, you have to provide all sorts of odd things and now he's back in court trying to say, well actually no, he isn't the feudal superior, the 1850 High Court case was a mistake. We shall see what happens. No, it's, it, it's, 
but there are two feudal owners of all the land in, in the United Kingdom, Elizabeth and Charles, and they're separate. The Charles's thing goes back to 1337. And his wife's now the Duchess of Cornwall or something? His wife is the Duchess Well, he's the Duke of Cornwall, yeah, he's, yeah, all these titles. I mean, Prince Charles's titles run over two pages. He's Lord of the Isles, Grand Admiral of the Waters Between, and uh, it's out of private eye. So or the Duchy is a corporation, yeah. Right. But if you come from Cornwall or live down there, it's important. He doesn't... He has private land holdings in Cornwall, which are separate from the fact that he owns all the this stuff. As I understood, you're saying, is there any legislation? Yeah, say that if somebody built like a house on the land that is technically owned by the Queen, does it mean she owns the property that is built on that no. land? No. No. That's where... And again, the law books, are, you know, you think after 140 years, there might be some clarity. There's none, mm. because the lawyers don't want to deal with this issue. They don't want the population alerted to the fact that freehold is a con in legal terms. And my sense of the Queen's position is that she's embarrassed by it. And um, I know I embarrassed her enormously when I discovered she was the largest landowner on earth. <laughs> that, as far as I know, that went down in Buckingham Palace like a bucket of lead. <laughs> that was a little, you know, but no, one of the curses of the situation we're in is there is far too much legislation. Nobody, nobody actually knows how many crimes there are in the statute book. It's either 40,000 or 1 million and 40,000. Nobody knows. So, and this has consequences. That's not a... If there are that many laws and people can find out everything about you, they can always catch you for something. There was a second doomsday. That was the House of Lords paving the way to actually end the Crown's uh, feudal ownership. Nobody noticed this at the time, that actually the freehold, 95% the, the of the country was in freehold to the aristocracy. This was in 1872. And these, w when everybody's saying, oh, you know, they want to change things and, you know, freeholds and leaseholds. And actually what they were really doing was pushing the crown out to give themselves the absolute ownership of 95% of Britain. This is, um, for what it's worth, I'm doing a doctorate at the moment um, <laughs> from the world through Britain to Devon. My doctorate's in land ownership in Devon. And there's this total collision between me and the academics because I can see what the peers were doing. It was a land grab. They thought it was great. You know, push the Queen out. But how did the Queen restore her, or how was the Crown restored? In 1925, the second doomsday is 1872. In 1925, there are six land acts, none of which was ever debated in either House of Parliament. They were put through on, you know, on the, and this reinserted the crown as the ultimate owner. So that doesn't come from ancient history. It comes from 1925, and it was a con. Second World War, the crown took 11,000. 11 million acres, 11, a sixth of the island. A sixth of the island. <coughs> But so who, who... No, no, during the war. During sorry, the during war. the war, yeah. So who was the official landowner before then? And when did it go to, like, Perfect. 19 something percent? Most of the big lumps of land were the big estates. Okay. Um, and, again, nobody it never crops up anywhere, but because they got no rent for the war years, most of the big estates did actually suffer. You know, they got paint and decoration and all sorts of bits and but they 
their rental stream was interrupted. But have you ever seen any record of them complaining? There was a f another fiddle, you know, behind the scenes. They got the land back in, in most places, except in um, down in Wiltshire. But mostly after the war, it was returned. But all this happened, it, I mean, most ordinary people, it just passed over their head. Nothing to do with them. You know, nobody came down at, say, a street and tried to occupy the, you know, the terraces in the streets. This was big swathes of the United Kingdom were taken over by the military and no rent was paid. There were other ways that they got money, but they didn't get the kind of money that you might have thought they would, that the military would pay rent. They didn't. Most of the island that you could do anything that, such as here on is in the hands of big estates. The Crown's ownership is not that relevant. It's a political issue, like it's not relevant to, there's a piece of land there and you want to put allotments on it. Who are you likely to run into? You're likely to run into the, free, the big freeholders. And this is where um, the population is 62 million. 65% of it lives in private mortgaged accommodation. All that land, all that, all those houses are on 2.5 million acres out of 60 million. It's less than 10 percent. Now, what happened? The big lump of the island is owned by people in the country. 70 percent of the United Kingdom is rural, or agricultural, or both, and that is owned by 525,000 families about 0.0% of the population and they own the 70% and mostly <coughs> if you want to do start a farm or start anything in the country those are the people you run into the biggest landowner in the United Kingdom is actually the state but it's a freeholder it's not an owner <coughs> government departments own about 3 million acres doesn't matter but the Queen is the biggest private landowner. As, as well as owning everything there, she also has private land. And that comes in two pieces. She owns Balmoral, the biggest Sandringham, and lots of other bits and pieces. But as the coalition government did within a year of formation, the Crown Estate has now been absolutely defined as belonging to the Queen separately like a kind of freeholder private separate freehold and the crown estate is worth 15 billion and it's 400 uh, 400,000 acres it's huge and not many of the big private none of the big private landowners come close so the queen in two, you know it's like a, a flanking attack she owns the left flank then she turns up owning the right one. Now, Tony asked me to raise issues of enclo the enclosures. Factual about the situation. Before, say, the 1700s or 1800s, ownership in the United Kingdom, the Crown owned everything. They were the big landowners held from the Crown. And then there was everybody else. What changed with the enclosures more dramatically than anything else was the big freeholders pushed the peasants out. They took the land over and what they mostly took was the rights rather than the land itself. Um, the peasantry of England have never really had ownership. Not from Norman times, whatever. But what the enclosures did was they took all the rights. That the pe you know, the right to go fish, the right to go cut the turf, the right to cut the wood the right to put the pigs into the forest and all this. During the 1800s and 1900s, eight in just England, and remember England isn't the United Kingdom, it's a bit of it. It's 32 million acres or 34 million acres out of 60 million. It is the biggest lump, but it's not. Um, in England alone, eight million acres of land had the peasants pushed out all their rights seized without compensation and 
the walls went up. That's why they're called enclosures. You don't, they're not as common as they used to be, but there are still estates with those walls around them. What the ordinary people had was rights rather than ownership. If you can split the two, it's much easier to understand it. But, and how good were your rights? Well, if, you, if the local landowner was a pillock, your rights were <laughs> worth a lot. If the local landowner was paternalistic and sensible because he needed your labor, uh, things were workable. But in the, after the Civil War in the 1600s, this drive to uh, make the land or put it all in the effective ownership of the aristocracy was extraordinary. There's no real record of this. You've got sort of partial records, but no one says, well, is, can you take a long view? And here's the long view, and it's really simple. In 1100 AD, there were three landowners in this country. The crown, the church, and the aristocracy. The, the third one is the one you never hear about. And the aristocracy had roughly between 40 and 50 percent ineffective freehold. They owned it. The church, the crown had uh, 20 percent, and the church had 30 percent. Well, obviously, in, during the Reformation, there was a bit of a change. There were only two forces left, the crown and the aristocracy. The church got cut out. Uh, but where do you see that in a history book? You don't. So we advanced to the second doomsday, 1870. And what's the situation? The aristocracy are the freeholders of 95% of the United Kingdom. They're not just freeholders of, you know, but they've got in their families, you have to think of families, don't do the tabloid thing and think of a duke or think of the families. This is a family thing. And they had 95%. So of course, uh, it would have been great for them if they pushed the crown out. They had won the war. They had won a war that had lasted 700 years. And the war was between the aristocracy and the crown. By 1870, the aristocracy had it, and the crown was Queen Victoria with 14,000 acres. Or New London gentry? They're much th they are the lower orders of the aristocracy. In this country, you have people with titles like Duke, Earl. They're the aristocracy. The landed gentry are their junior cousins, yeah. uh, and they intermarry the whole way. You know, it's a family structure. What you re if you push the curtains away, what you find is a single family structure with very high titles up at the top. And then you come down to the local ones. It was an extraordinary structure, and it was rigid. The, in 1872, the aristocracy and the landed gentry, 95% of the land and every single post, they were the magistrates, they were the police, they were the judges, they were the MPs. The United Kingdom was one of the most tightly and rigidly controlled countries ever. And nobody really noticed. But the structure did start to break up. There's a fair amount of transfers of land to call them working farmers. That's well, it accelerated a bit after 1870. But you, the, in the second doomsday, there's a set of ar aristocrats who have big estates. They have been cut by about 50%. But the estates haven't changed. They're mostly still in either the cousins or the family or some, somebody else. But for the Devon Doctorate, okay, in two sentences. If you wanted to be a big landowner in Devon, you needed to arrive before 11.30. And I don't mean 11.30 in the morning. The big estates were formed in the century after the invasion. And they're pretty well there still. So, okay. Anyone want to dig, in, dig into that a bit? I think the big question is, why is the history so biased? And why 
is some Irish renegade running around writing it. When where's all the English? Where are all the English? And why am I bogged down in a bloody doctorate when, when I've written the It's fascinating doing it. it. This is how I found out where the estate started. And one of the interesting facts is the normal form of transmission of an estate wasn't in the male line, it was female. The majority, say more than 50% of all estates between 1200 and now would reach their current owner through a succession of heiresses, not through the male line. The number of estates where the male line is persistent are very rare. There's only about ten of them. I mean, every single generation. I mean, sorry. I mean, every single generation male is rare. You have to shout, sorry. I mean, every single generation is, is isn't male. No. You say every single generation goes female. No, no, fifty percent. It's not. It's age. just. It's just over the. You know, it wasn't all the estates, but the majority of transmissions were through a female, not through a male. I mean, the big estates in Devon were all heiress accumulations. Is that, is that something to do with but name change? Sorry? Is that something to do with, like, females' name changing? No, I, females were less fragile than males, was the way I'd see it. The males either went out fighting and doing well, stupid yeah, things, and getting themselves killed in duels, you know, to make it simple. You noble diggers all stand up now, stand up now. You noble diggers all stand up now.